Hello everyone and welcome to the November Virtual Planetarium with Pete Lawrence and myself Paul Abel and as ever we will start with the inner solar system and the planet Mercury. It's an evening object during November but extremely low down and I think if you live in really a Really bad actually in November which hard. is surprising. It's normally it's normally fairly good actually in November, um, but uh, no, it's not going to be very good this one. I think the best time to see it actually is right at the very end of the month, um, when it's about forty minutes after sunset. But it'll be right. Wait for this, Paul. About a degree above the horizon. Right. So I regard that as practically invisible. Then so it's not, you give up so easily. Uh, I don't know. It's unreasonable. <laughs> of me, isn't it? It's okay. because it's in Sagittarius, which is a very low part of the ecliptic, of course. It is. So Mercury, not really any good for uh, for November. However, the planet Venus is blazing away in the morning sky. In October, it passed through um, dichotomy, so it was 50% illuminated. And now the planet is moving away from us, so it's in a, a waxing gibbous phase, uh, but still quite prominent in the morning sky. Yes, it is. It's a, a beautiful planet to see, especially if you have to get up early and you pop outside and you see it shining away in the uh, the dawn light isn't it and it's really is really quite something as you say it's going into its gibbous phase on the 1st of november it's about 54 percent lit um, and appears 22 arc seconds across which is a decent size but to be fair it's quite subtle in in nature isn't it uh, venus it is the surface markings. Uh, you need to be sensitive to the blue end of the spectrum to see the the the, the cloud markings and uh, imaging them. You can catch them, but they're best caught uh, in UV imaging. So uh, you need a UV filter to do that. Uh, but still, it's nice to see the phase, and you can see the brighter cusp regions covering the poles uh, when they're particularly prominent. Yeah. Uh, we have an interesting event with Venus. That is the uh, the moon is going to pass in front of Venus. Oh, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, it's on uh, the 9th, isn't it? On the 9th of November, and we'll discuss that a bit more uh, when we get to the special events. Um, okay. Next planet out, Mars, not visible this month. It's still lurking behind, low down on the horizon and very close to the sun. It actually lines up with the sun, Mars, on the 17th of November. So, yay, it'll <laughs> be moving into the, the morning sky after that. And uh, but, then it will start to become viable, but really not until next year. In fact, I, I've ran a simulation the other day. I don't think it's going to be really a viable target till summer next year. So uh, gone for the foreseeable future, I think. I think, actually, if you if you look into the early part of next year, the planets are going to be quite poor. Um, but it's the, it's the latter part of the year. They're just going to burst into life and they're going to be spectacular. But don't worry if you're listening, thinking, <laughs> oh, no, no planets, because... There's plenty to take their place. There are some interesting things coming up at the beginning of 2024. Well, let's jump back to one which is absolutely superb at the moment, and that's the planet Jupiter, which yes. reaches opposition on the 3rd of November. And from the UK, well, it's overhead, we describe it. It actually gets to an altitude of 51 degrees, <laughs> which is, isn't overhead, but as far as we're concerned, it is because it's been so poor over previous years. It has, and now it really is high up. And the, the reason why we're all celebrating the fact it's high up is because the, the light from Jupiter uh, passes through a thinner layer of the atmosphere. When objects are low down, it has to pass more through the atmosphere, more of the atmosphere is thicker, yeah. and it gets distorted by the poor seeing. So hopefully we should have some splendid views of Jupiter. I have to say, I've had some absolutely wonderful views of it uh, the, the, this, this year with the 12-inch Newtonian. Um, some stunning details. Uh, I'm finding the Great Red Spot a little harder to see because it's a bit smaller now. But a bit smaller, isn't it? Yes. It's smaller and, and not quite as striking, but it still should easily be detectable in a 4-inch telescope. And you can always put a blue filter on your eyepiece to, to bring out the detail that will increase the contrast. That darkens the Great Red Spot, yeah? Yes, it does, uh, considerably, actually. Uh, but here's the thing. If you're using a smaller telescope... You don't, don't use a violet filter because that will be too thick and you'll see very little. So it has to be a, a, a filter that allows quite a lot of light to come through. Yeah, OK. Well, Saturn is still in the sky and it, it gets to a... It's, it's a reasonable altitude compared to what it was over previous years. It, from the UK, it gets to about 24 degrees, which may seem nothing to write home about, but it does 
lifted enough to get a reasonable view. It's um, it's ironic, isn't it, that as as it's getting higher in the sky, the beautiful ring system is becoming more and more edge on to us. It is. Uh, it's actually noticeable the uh, just how shallow the rings are in their angle, their tilt this year compared to last year. And as a result of this, it becomes harder to see really quite prominent things like the Cassini division. Yes. Stop gap that separates uh but uh, rings a and b uh, and other things as well but there is a, a positive to this the rings have been covering up the southern hemisphere of the planet and now they are reducing in angle and we're getting to see more of it yes and there's been right. some interesting colors in the southern hemisphere of saturn these blues and greens appearing so that's quite interesting and in i think it's 2025 we go through the ring plane crossing yes where it goes edge on and it um it at that point, Saturn appears ringless because the rings are really quite thin. And when they're edge on to us, it, it can be difficult to actually see them at all. It can, But I yes. think it's quite close to the sun when that happens, which um, will make it more difficult. But the, the real benefit of having a ring plane crossing is that the major satellites of Saturn, they orbit or tend to orbit quite close to the equatorial plane of the planet. There are some which have got weird inclined orbits, but the, the major ones tend to um, orbit in that plane, which means that when we go through a ring plane crossing, the satellite uh, orbits also line up with the planet's globe. So those satellites can pass across the globe casting shadows onto the planet's atmosphere like you get with Jupiter but they're much harder to see of course because Saturn's further away except for one which it's is Titan. Titan. Yes, yeah. yeah. I've uh, never uh, seen a transit of Titan in all these years. Um, I, I never have either. And the reason for that, the last time this happened, when I was sort of active and looking for it, the timings were exactly wrong. Yes. They were all happening when <laughs> Saturn wasn't visible. But that's not going to be the case this time. And if we are patient, go through to the end of 2024, there are a number of uh, Titan satellite shadow transits occurring and then as we go into 2025 of course we'll get titan itself moving across yeah i think that'll be quite interesting and i'm hoping to get to get one of these elusive transits i did in the previous time that saturn passed through we passed through the ring plate i did get some uh, some transits of the of the other satellites but i think to see titan and its shadow on the disk of saturn will be really striking so look forward to that i can remember actually sitting in uh, the garden with some Patrick Moore um, doing a sky at night d describing what was happening and they always had a <laughs> it was a model of the solar system which was inflatable I don't know if you remember that when you this was 2008 this was 2009 I think that was my first one actually yeah I think well, they, that's the first one I ever did it was always quite amusing because it, it was sort of dr drawing straws as to who got the the worst uh, object to inflate which of course was the sun you needed a lot of uh, puff to get that one up but <laughs> but saturn had inflatable rings as well and they never quite worked they always drooped and i can remember patrick sitting there explaining this with this sort of droopy model inflated model of saturn <laughs> yeah i remember that i think that was my first one um uh, so Little fact that may or may not make it into this edit. The reason why 2001 was switched from location from Saturn to Jupiter was because the artistic people uh, involved in it didn't think they could get Saturn's rings to look realistic. So it kind of ties into the problems we had on the programme, albeit a different scale of budget. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's carry on out to the next planet. So the ice giants now, and they are actually pretty good. So yes. Uranus, best time to see, 13th of November in the constellation of Aries. Um, it's really quite well presented for the whole month. It comes to opposition on the 13th of November and can be found near the Aries Taurus board. Uh, it's quite uh, difficult to see with the unaided eye, but binoculars or a small telescope, it's I find it unmistakable. It's it's now about five point six actually, so it's it's worth having a go if you've got really dark skies. And of course, it's quite interesting because it's near to Jupiter as well and the Pleiades, so they're all sort of coming together. These, these this 
uh, pair of planets. They are. Uh, next planet out, Neptune. Uh, best time to see 1st of November. Uh, so it's also an evening planet. Uh, again, well-placed all month. Uh, peak altitude of 34 degrees under dark sky. Conditions can be found throughout uh, November. Uh, this is a little fainter, magnitude 7.9, so you will need at least a good pair of binoculars to be able to see it. Yes, indeed. Right, well, let's have a look at some of the special events which are happening. Um, we've got one on the 4th where we've got rising just after 10 p.m. Universal Time, a 53% lit waning gibbous moon. So that's just before last quarter. Sits three degrees north of the Beehive Cluster, Messier 44. And it's, it's also worth looking at, at Jupiter at this time. Now, there, there are a number of moon events which are happening with Jupiter which are uh, well worth looking out for. And the, the best advice I can give there is to have a look in the magazine because they're listed in there. But interestingly, around opposition, when a moon transits across uh, Jupiter's disk, its shadow is more or less in sync with it. If you get it exactly at the right time, they appear to be touching, if not overlapping. Yeah, I have seen them overlapping before. It's quite an eerie sight because it, it, it looks like the moon has a, a black outline around it. It's, it's oh, yeah, quite, yeah. quite strange. But, yeah, so that's a good one. Uh, we have a similar event on the 5th, of course, the 5th of November. Um, Io transits, again, in sync with its shadow uh, between 0355 and 0605 in the morning. Um, but, of course, the atmosphere might be a bit smoky because it's November the 5th. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I think the one to look out for is actually on the 10th of November when we get a lovely Ganymede and shadow transit yes. occurring. Um, because that is a week after opposition, there will be a gap between the moon and its shadow at that time. But um, yeah, it, Ganymede's shadow transits are always very good. And there are a couple of others which are listed in the magazine as well. Uh, as Paul mentioned, on the 9th of November, there's a daylight lunar occultation of Venus. Now, you might think, oh, another daylight lunar occultation of a planet. <laughs> um, but this isn't too bad, actually, because uh, Venus is bright, of course, and the moon should be fairly easy to pick up as well. If you struggle, um, the actual event occurs between 0943 and 1041. If you've got time... Um, if you don't have to go to work or whatever and you can pick it up in or the pair up in the dawn twilight just stay with them and then until the occultation occurs and you should be able to see them assuming it's clear of course yes if it's clear that'll be a nice event actually i've never seen an occultation of venus with by the moon so uh, that'll be a the, nice, the nice first thing. one i ever did i remember it very well um, it was cloudy right up until the point of occultation and then there were a, just a few gaps so i actually had to set the telescope up and try and get the edge of the moon to get focus on and it was really stressful but i did manage to get it and i felt a real sense of achievement um Always that, on it, the edge for you, isn't it? Every astronomical event. Oh, it only it's just my, about it's happened. the atmosphere. Yeah, <laughs> it's the atmosphere. Uh, well, talking about on the edge, do you see what I, I've done here? Uh, the, I nearly blinked and missed it, Pete. <laughs> on the 10th... <laughs> I, I don't get any praise at all. On the 10th of November, liberation, lunar liberation, will favour a view of Mare Orientale, which is the eastern sea. It's a... a a dark center of a huge multi-ringed basin um, and it's called the eastern sea which is ironic because it's now on the western or southwestern part of the moon but um, it's worth looking at the edge of the moon on the 10th and see if you can see any evidence of it yes it's actually uh there's the rook mountains and then the maria orientale uh is behind this so we should perhaps explain that uh this the, the east and west on the moon was originally the other way round. So the Mare Orientale was indeed on the eastern limb. And then the it IAU was. switched east to west round. So now it's on the western limb, which is unfortunate. But uh, it's quite a quite an impressive sight. Have you ever seen it? Have you got an image of it? I think you have, haven't you? Yes, I've got I've got an image. It's got these two beautiful ringed uh, mountain ranges, as you say, Monts Rook and what's the other one? Monts Cordillera, the mm -hmm. other one. And are they... Um, You've got to have a bit of imagination because you're looking at it right on the very edge of the moon and it's terribly foreshortened, but it's a massive structure. If you saw it, if, if the moon could be turned around a little bit, uh, you would be able to see it like a, a giant um, bullseye 
on the moon and giant is the right word it's just huge this thing so it's worth having a go for it's worth trying to take a picture of it or doing a sketch of it and then trying to decode it afterwards that's where the fun comes in because you suddenly start to realize what it was you were looking at yes absolutely Okay, well, on the 18th, we have the Leonid meteor shower reaching its peak in the morning. Uh, maximum activity is expected in the morning, and it is under favourable conditions this year, so it's worth braving the cold and going out and having a look, I think. Yes, so that's the night of the 17th into the morning of the 18th, and the Leonids... It's quite a low-rate shower, to be fair. But yeah. um, if you do get a bright Leonid fireball, which appears... I mean, Leonids emanate from the radiant which is in the head of Leo the Lion so that's in the curved bit of the sickle so it's particularly easy to identify where the radiant would be um, but if you do see a, a Leonid fireball they tend to have a very greenish hue to them so they can be really impressive I can remember seeing one many years ago actually when I, I was taking my children to a um, it was a, a school firework event and there was this massive green uh, meteor that went across the sky, which I don't think anybody noticed because they thought it was a fireball, uh, a firework. Oh dear! But <laughs> well, that was a Leonid, a definite Leonid. But the the reason why the Leonids is known or well known is because every thirty three years it has an outburst where mm. you can get from many hundreds to many thousands of meteors per hour. But um, the next one is due, I think, about 2032-ish, that sort of time. So we've got a little time to wait, really. Yeah, and of course, meteor showers are fascinating things in their own right because we never quite know how active the shower is going to be. So uh, Very true. Interesting to see what happens then. Okay, well, let's move on to the night sky now. So uh, facing south in the early evening, we have all of the... Rather faint, in fact, I might even say obscure, watery <laughs> constellations of autumn. But perhaps the best one, the most promising one that's really quite obvious, is not a, itself a water constellation, but it is a constellation we can use to find them. That's the Great Square of Pegasus. Um, so I think if you if you kind of look south, you'll you'll see it. It's not a perfect square, and it's not particularly bright. But once you find it, it is unmistakable, don't you think? It's quite large. Yeah, it's like yeah. a. a the great void of Pegasus is probably a good way to describe it because it's quite. It looks initially quite empty, but there are stars in it, and actually counting them is a good indicator of how clear your sky is. Um, but if you look to the south of the Great Square, then you'll find the faint circlet asterism, and this is this is pretty faint actually from a city location. It's quite difficult to pick up, and from a town, you'd probably struggle a bit as well. Um, but that's the circlet of Pisces. That represents the western fish of Pisces. The northern fish, which because the it the I've got to explain that the fish are tied <laughs> together by a cord. <laughs> okay, it's weird. Uh, oh, but they're dear. tied together by a cord which runs along eastward underneath the square of Pegasus, more or less parallel with the southern edge of the great square, to the star Alresha, and then it's the cord heads up to the north, so it runs parallel with the northern... Uh, sorry, the... Uh, eastern edge of the great square of pegasus and that's where you get a little triangle which represents the northern fish and i can't see it i mean it's it's so obscure it's really really difficult i'd, I'd love the idea of two fish tied with a rope i mean that's got to be a wonderful way of killing an afternoon <laughs> if you've got nothing better to do i think the mythology of that if i can remember correctly i can't remember who the gods were but they were sitting by the the side of a river and a monster appeared which frightened them so they tie, tied themselves together and turned themselves into fish and jumped in the river as you would as you would I mean, but it's uh, quite plausible when it's put like that isn't it yeah it's, uh, it's other than that's how they ended up in the sky is is not clear but never mind okay we're well, moving on from pisces <laughs> to the southwest sits the rather sprawling form of the constellation of aquarius the water bearer and the most recognizable pattern of stars here is a small group of four stars and they do kind of look like they're arranged like spokes of a three-pronged steering wheel um you can kind of imagine that so it's one of the few asterisms that really does look like what it is i think yeah well it's an old asterism so we get into trouble when we call it the steering wheel but 
I don't care because okay. <laughs> asterisms are actually unofficial, so you can call them what you like. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> the um, <laughs> steering wheel, which it, that's how I always got to know it because I, when I was out doing meteor watches, it was a very distinctive pattern of four stars arranged, as you say, with one in the centre and the other three at 120 degree intervals, marking the ends of the spokes. But the original... Uh, term for this asterism is the water jar it's the water jar of Aries because he's a water bearer and if you look below that asterism there are some curious patterns of stars there are there are a couple of them which are arranged in curves which face away from each other and that they're supposed to represent where the water is hitting the ground and spilling out so right. it but it, it's it's really quite a difficult constellation to work out i mean it's got two bright i wouldn't call them massively bright but two brighter <laughs> stars in there um which are saddle sud and um saddle melik but um, right. yeah it's it's a tricky one isn't it really it's a, it is a tough constellation but there are a couple of interesting things in there though so it is actually worth finding it and one of these is NGC 7009 oh, the yes. Saturn Nebula and it, in photographs it does resemble um, a sort of faint version of Saturn more like the edge on Saturn rather than the rings wide open um, it's a planetary nebula with these two extensions either side of its main disc um, and this is the remains of a star very similar size to the sun probably that came to the end of its life and the uh, the nebula is all that's all that's left now um, and the way the gas is the way the gas has distributed itself, it kind of gives the appearance of Saturn. I have to say, I have seen it a couple of times. I struggled to see the Saturn shape, but that is because it is rather low down. Yeah, those extensions are pretty faint, aren't they, and difficult to pick up. But there is another planetary nebula in Aquarius, which has it's quite a tantalizing one, especially when you see photographs of it, and that's NGC 7293, which is the Helix Nebula, yes. which is the closest planetary nebula to Earth. It's about just under 700 light years away. But the big problem with the Helix is that it's massive, yeah. it appears about 25 arc minutes. Can you imagine that across? Um, that means that even though it's listed as a magnitude plus 7.6 object, that light is spread over a large area and its surface brightness is pretty low. It is quite tough to see, and in fact, you don't need much in the way of smoke, haze, or even a bit of moonlight. And it's um, even in a large telescope, it's nigh on impossible to see. But as you say, if you've got access to imaging, so and software you can take a nice uh, take a nice image of it and show show the structure there um so yeah it's it's also worth noting actually paul there's a there's a nice globular in aquarius m2 there is, there is uh, that is very pretty actually and not so badly affected by being low down so yeah that's definitely worth a look yeah uh, southwest of aquarius is capricornus the sea goat so this is a rather ancient constellation and the, the stars in it are assembled so it kind of looks a bit like a triangle so uh, it does a down pointing triangle a down pointing triangle uh, and this contains the globular cluster uh, m30 yes which is an interesting globular um it's a somewhat infamous globular cluster because uh in march if the weather and the timing of the moon i.e the moon's out of the way are good it's possible to see the entire messier catalog in one night except for m30 yes so it kind of uh, throws a th uh, th uh, throw a thorn in the side then because uh, it is not visible. Well, if we carry on with the watery theme, east of Aquarius and south of Pisces is Cetus, the whale or sea monster, however you want to see him. It's an interesting shape, actually, because when you see the outline on a chart, it does look like the outline of a west-facing whale. Yes. Which is ironic because the star which is in the western side of Cetus is uh, Deneb Katos, which means the whale's tail. So <laughs> it's the wrong way around. And that's often the case, isn't it? It's uh, You often see things. There's another one which comes to mind, actually, is Hercules, yes, which looks twice. like he's marching across the sky um, the right way up. But actually, in mythology, he's, he's upside down. Yeah, in particular with Hercules, it's the keystone asterism, which looks like a male torso, which makes you, you know, think, oh, they're like, okay, I can see that that's Hercules. But yeah, as you say, if you look at the charts, 
it's the other way around. Yeah. Deeply confusing, but, it is. but never mind. Well, there are several galaxies worth mentioning in this part of the sky as well, in the, um, in the November sky. I suppose the, the biggest and brightest one to look out for is the famous Messier 31, the Andromeda galaxy, which is in the constellation of Andromeda, which is a wedge-shaped constellation which appears to spread from the star in the northeast corner of the Great Square up to the northeast. In fact, the star in the northeast corner of the Great Square is or belongs to Andromeda. Um, so, uh, yeah, that. So, if you go along that wedge, about halfway along it, and then look north and west of that point. That's where Messier 31 is, the Andromeda galaxy. And to the naked eye, from a reasonably dark site, it looks a bit like a uh, an elongated smudge of light. Yes. Um, it's unfortunate because it is quite a large galaxy, so uh, it's not best seen in, in a telescope unless it's a small telescope because otherwise you're just looking right into the core. Um, yes. There are there is a couple of nice satellite galaxies near there. It's uh, M thirty two and uh, uh, and another one nearby that you can see. Uh, M one hundred and ten. That's yeah. it. M one hundred and ten. Uh, those are quite pretty. Uh, but I think one of the best views I've ever had of uh, of M thirty one was with my small pair of ten by thirty binoculars yes. in Norfolk in a dark sky. Uh, that really did show it up very well. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. And um, as you say, you need to sort of take it all in because the bit you're looking at with the naked eye is really the core. Yeah. And when, when you magnify the core through a telescope, what you see is sort of a, a larger version of what you see with the naked eye. And it can be a bit disappointing. You need to give it time. You need to be really dark adapted. You do, yes. Well, in Pisces, if we go back into Pisces, there's a fainter galaxy known as M74, which is um, a face-on spiral which lies very close to the star Eta Piscium. So that makes it really easy to find. But there, there is another one. I don't know if you've ever seen this, Paul. It's called the Silver Dollar Galaxy, which is um, NGC 253, which sits to the south of, of Deneb Katos in Cetus, and now that star is already quite low from UK skies, but the Silver Dollar Galaxy, NGC 253, is quite an impressive object. No, I have never seen it. Uh, possibly because I, it's going to be hidden from houses from where I am. I might be tempted to turn the university telescope onto it if it will go down that low. Yes. Uh, it, it is quite low down. It's, it's probably one of those things that's best scanned with a small telescope. Uh, that if you can get to a site that has a very clear horizon, then that's one of the targets, uh, the dark sky, that's one of the targets worth doing, I should think. But no, I've never seen it. I will add it to the list of things to observe, Pete. I would heartily recommend it. I was really quite surprised when I, I imaged it um, a few years back, and it was a beautiful object, really lovely. OK, well, that's everything in the night sky you can see for November. Um, I hope you all have some nice clear skies and we'll see you in the next Virtual Planetarium. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Paul.